Good morning, everyone. Hope you guys are having a good day. Um, I wanted to hop on and talk to you guys about a subject that, you know, I'm gonna be honest, it probably won't be very popular, um, but it's something important because, you know, if you're gonna be a strong believer in the body of Christ, um, this is something that you more than likely are going to have to go through at some point in your life, amen? Um, <clears throat> especially if you are going to be in leadership in the body of Christ. So what I wanna talk to you guys about today is something called the Isaac test, okay? Um, and we're gonna be in the book of Genesis today. Um, and I've got quite a bit of scripture. This is a relatively simple concept, but how you handle the Isaac test in one season determines a lot of the time how you can move forward in the next season or whether or not you've got to go back around the mountain again in your personal life. Now, here's the thing that I love about God. Even if we fail this test the first time we take it, you know, um, God is so faithful. He will let you go back around the mountain again. He will let you learn from your mistakes and he will let you move forward. Amen. Um, but how many of you guys know it's a lot easier to just pass it the first time, amen, than it is to have to go back around the mountain over and over again in our personal lives. Um, and so I'm going to be honest with you guys. The first time that I took the Isaac test, I failed it miserably in my life as a younger believer. Um, but then several times since I have passed this test and, you know, so I just want to encourage you guys, if you listen to this today and you go, man, I didn't pass the test, quote unquote, I don't want you guys to be discouraged. You know, God loves you. He wants to help you through this stuff, but it has a purpose behind it. Um, and it's a very important purpose. So we're going to be talking about, even though we're talking about kind of testing today a little bit, we're going to be talking about the blessing today and how God wants you even more badly than you want it yourself to be able to receive blessing in your life and to be able to sustain blessing in your life. Um, so that's what we're going to be chatting through a little bit today. Um, <clears throat> and I apologize. I've been kind of dealing with sinus cred that kicked in. So I'm going to be drinking some hot tea and we're going to be praying that Jill's voice holds out. Amen. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. But just so you know, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through, what is the end of this verse? 18. Um, and this is the story in the Bible where Abraham is asked by God to go and to sacrifice Isaac on the altar. Amen. So that's what we're getting into. Let me grab some tea and we'll hop into this. Okay. Alrighty, ladies and gents. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you quite a bit of scripture and then we'll break this down a little bit more together as we go. Okay. So let me give you some backstory before we read this. Remember that Isaac was the promised child that Abraham and Sarah prayed for for forever. Like he was the miracle child, right? They were both old. They shouldn't have been able to have kiddos anymore based purely on their age and their physical status. And, you know, they had already kind of messed up and tried to do things in their own strength. Therefore, Ishmael was born previously. Um, and so then, you know, all these years of waiting, all these years of praying, all these years of contending, and their promise has finally arrived. Like, I want you guys to understand the significance of this backstory before we read this scripture. Because think about this. They had waited the majority of their lives to receive this gift from the Lord. And I'm sure that they had moments where they were like, God, have you forgotten? about me. God, you know, you, I know you promised us this, but look, this is beyond our natural capabilities, you know, and the natural God, why would you wait this long to deliver this thing? Why would you do this? And so when this kiddo arrived, it wasn't just a little deal. It was a big deal, right? Because not only was it God being faithful, um, but it represented, you know, that God doesn't have to do things the way that he thinks that we should have to do them a lot of the time. Amen. God can do things however he wants to do them. We serve a God who is more than able to do the impossible. Amen. And our personal lives. And so what God did is he let them enjoy this blessing for just a little bit. You know, Isaac was not very old when it was time, you know, um, when God kind of petitioned Abraham, I want you to go and sacrifice him or whatever. And so God gave them a little glimpse of what the blessing would look like. Amen. Just a little taste of what this thing would look like. And then that's where we're going to kick into our story. All right. So I'm sure that from Abraham and Sarah's perspective, they were thinking in their heads, man, now I can finally rest. 
I spent the majority of my life contending, the majority of my life believing for this thing. You know, we've had some slip ups along the way because we tried to do things in our own flesh. We tried to do things in our own strength, kind of a deal. And they're like, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sure they were like, you know, finally, maybe we can just rest in this particular thing. But here's the story. And this is where the test comes in. And before I start reading this, I want to remind you guys, how many of you guys know that the Bible says that our faith as a Christian has to be tested? Amen. And a lot of people might think, well, why would God do that? Why does he just want to torture us? No, it's for your intended good down the line. And that's part of what I want to show you through the Isaac test is what I like to call it is because, you know, God wants you to be able to sustain the blessing, to keep the blessing, to be able to enjoy the blessing. Um, but it requires the correct response from us. So we're going to go ahead and dive into this in just a second. Okay, let's get going. So Genesis 22, starting in verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now, I want you guys to imagine Abraham's emotion in this moment, okay? So first of all, it made it very clear in this passage, a couple of different very important things. Number one, this was Abraham's only kiddo, okay? It's not like he had a whole bunch of kids. This was it, right? And so that in itself is tough, right? I mean, even if you're not looking at the big picture of like them contending for this promise for forever and all of this, you know, really hard stuff that they went through to even get to this point, right? He was the only son that Abraham had, all right? And so the next verse that I want you guys to focus on is it says, take now your son, your only son, whom you love. So this was something that Abraham, like a lot of you guys who are parents, you know, he was super attached to this thing. There was not much more in Abraham's life that meant more to him than this kiddo right here. And, you know, I would think that he would probably treasure it even more because of how much, you know, they waited for this promise because of, you know, um, what they went through. You know, how many of you guys know that sometimes if you wait longer for something, you appreciate it more? Amen. The more that you go through to get to something, you know, the more that you appreciate it a lot of the time. Um, think about like, you know, if you start your own business versus working for someone else's business. Yeah, you might truly enjoy something and have a really good work ethic if you work for someone else's business. But man, if you poured your blood, sweat, and tears into your own business and starting that thing up, and if you cultivated it and spent sleepless days and nights trying to get stuff going, and then it takes off and is a success, which one do you think is going to have more impact on you, right? And so this was something that was very, very close to Abraham's heart. I would probably guess to say that this was probably the closest thing to his heart. Amen. And so what do you do when God asks you for the very thing that is the most important to you? What do you do when God asks you for that thing in your life that is the closest to your heart at that particular moment in your life? This is the Isaac test, ladies and gents. And so Basically, we're going to talk about the purpose behind this in a little bit, but this could represent a bunch of different things. This could represent a dream of a business. You know, this could represent the dream of a ministry, you know, the dream of a marriage, the dream of a child, whatever this is, you know, in your personal life. And, you know, this is kind of where Abraham was. You know, he, God was faithful. He delivered the promise, right? And now he's suddenly like, oh my word, are you going to take this away from me, God? You know? And so this is where your faith has to kick in. Ladies and gents, this was his faith being tested, right? This is where the devil tries to come into our lives as Christians and he starts to spew lies to us about God's character, about his goodness. You know, but if we truly believed in the goodness of God, kind of like Abraham did, we're about to look at this in this passage. If we would truly believe in the goodness of God and his character over our situations, we would understand that we really have nothing to fear. Because even if on the off chance it didn't happen, right? Even if on the off chance that Isaac did have to be sacrificed and God did ask for that thing back, 
it would have been for Abraham and for that kiddo's good, all right? You know, God's character is so good in your life that, you know, God never asks you for something in your life, you know, if he doesn't have a better plan to give you something better in return if he says no to you over a situation. And sometimes it isn't a no. Sometimes he's just looking to see if that thing has a hold over you or if you can really receive and sustain it. I wrote down a phrase that I want you guys to remember, and this is kind of the big phrase of our entire topic today. God wants you to have the blessing, okay? I want you to get that in your noggin, all right? Regardless of the testing that we go through in our lives, you've always got to remember this. He wants you to step into those blessings that he has for your life even more than you want them in your personal life, okay? But he doesn't want the blessing to quote unquote have you. Let me talk about what that means. God wants you to be able to have and enjoy the blessing, but he doesn't want that blessing to come first in your life over his place in your life. He doesn't want that blessing to have power and control and manipulative factors over your life. Amen. He still wants to be in first place. And the reason for this is he knows that if that blessing had control over you and if it was in first place rather than him being in first place, it wouldn't be a good gift. You know, a lot of times if we don't take this test and if we don't pass it in our personal lives, what can happen to us a lot of the time is God will give us a blessing and then we'll abort it a few years down the line. Amen. This is why, and you know, I see this in a lot of different contexts. Let me bring up one that's just coming to the top of my head. Do you ever see people that are just stupid gifted? you know, like crazy talented and they will pop up for a few years and they'll be a big deal. But then all of a sudden it just feels like they kind of fall off the face of the planet or maybe they fall into sin or, you know, whatever happens. Well, the reason for that is a lot of the times because, you know, this Isaac test stuff, they never went through it. Amen. You know, this thing that they were really good at in their life, you know, was not a surrendered thing. Amen. You know, it was something that God really wanted for them. God wanted them to step into this stuff a lot of the time, but it was an idol. Amen. It wasn't, God still wasn't in first place in these people's lives. Therefore, they couldn't sustain it down the line. Amen. And how many of you guys know that God is so good over your life that he doesn't just want to give you something that's going to last a year or two. He wants it to be a good blessing for you for the rest of your life or for the season that he intends for it to be there. Amen. When God prepares you for blessing in your life, he doesn't just prepare you for a moment. He prepares you to sustain blessing. Think about this like in the work place. You know, God doesn't just prepare you, you know, to receive that manager role, you know, right after the interview happens. He prepares your character to be able to stay in that role for however long you need to be there. He gives you the wisdom for the stewardship power of that role. Amen. All of this different stuff, right? God wants you to be able to sustain the blessings that he has for your personal life and to be able to truly enjoy them. You know, here's the deal. When a blessing has, you know, hold or control over you rather than you being in control over it and being controlled by God in your personal life as your first and, for, first and foremost, you know, when that blessing has control over you, that is a very taxing, awful place to be. You know, a lot of times we might think it's not in the moment, but that's a place of absolute torture, you know, because, you know, anything that's not God is not perfect. Amen. Whether it's a job, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a situation that you're believing for, whatever that is, there's nothing perfect but God. And so if you are letting a situation have control over you more in your life than you are God, you know, that imperfection is going to hurt you at some point. Amen. And it's not that they're even bad people, bad circumstances, whatever it is, but the only one who's perfect is God, ladies and gents. And it's unfair of us to expect other people to be perfect. Amen. And so what happens with the Isaac test is a lot of times God will try to gift us with different things in our lives that he has for us. And he will purposefully say, all right, now are you going to surrender it back to me? If I ask you for this thing, you know, if I say, are you willing to step away from this thing? Are you willing to pray the prayer? Your will be done, God, over this area of my life. You know, God's watching to see, will you surrender it to him? Amen. Or does this thing still have so much of a hold over you that you would look at God and say, no, I refuse to give this thing back to you. Amen. And you know, here's the deal. 
I think that a lot of the time um, when people read this story, they just assume that God does not consider your heart desires. He does a ton. And God wants you to lift up your heart's desires to him. Oftentimes he's the one who put those desires of your heart on your heart. I want to remind you guys of that, ladies and gents. He's not doing this to be mean. But a lot of times in our faith has to be tested. Yes, it's proving somewhat to God that we're ready to sustain the blessing, that we're ready to go there. But a lot of times it's to prove it to ourselves. Hello, who am I talking to today? You know, God needs you to see that you're ready to sustain the blessing sometimes in your life. And maybe you failed this test in a past season and then you retake the test in a different way, shape, or form later on in your life and you pass it. And God looks at you and he goes, well done, my good and faithful servant. You're ready for this thing now. You can sustain this thing now. This thing no longer has power and control over you. You know, blessings in our life should always be approached from the following manner. It should be, God, you know, I would love to walk in this thing. This thing is so awesome. I am so grateful for this thing, but I don't have to have this thing in my life. Who am I talking to today? I don't have to have this thing. I want this thing, but it's not going to have a hold over me in my life because I choose you first and foremost. Amen. And I have to have you, God, but I don't have to have this other thing, you know, even if I really want it, even if it's something that I know that you really want for me, God, I don't have to have this thing. And ultimately, if you ask that me, you know, for this thing back in my life, I know that it's because you're working things for my good. Amen. And so sometimes, ladies and gents, God's response will be different in response to the Isaac test when we face it in our personal lives. Sometimes God will ask for your Isaac excuse me, that represents like the place of blessing, that thing that you've been believing for. Sometimes he will ask for it back and he will keep it. Amen. And it's because it was never the right thing in the first place. Amen. So sometimes that represents a job you weren't supposed to have, a relationship you weren't supposed to have, a ministry opportunity you weren't supposed to have. You know, I've known friends who were trying to buy a house and the house sale fell through. You know, so this could represent a bunch of different things, right? But sometimes when it's not God's will over a circumstance, he'll ask for it back. And that's where your faith has to kick in. And you have to go, you know what, God, I so trust you with this particular area of my life and your goodness, knowing that if you're taking this thing away now, if you're saying no to this thing right now, I trust that you've got something so much better down the line because you don't do things accidentally in my life and you never do things to hurt me. Amen. Um, I did a video with you guys not all that long ago that talked about how, you know, God is not withholding any good thing from you. That's straight up scripture. And I think that we need to remind ourselves about this on a regular basis, that if God is taking something from you in your life, it's not to hurt you. It's not to crush you. It's because it's not good for you in some way, shape, or form. And a lot of times we don't see the intricacies of that behind the scenes. We don't see the full big picture, but God does. Amen. And so this is where your faith is tested a lot of the time. But, you know, especially with regards to the Isaac test, um, what I've seen more often than not, especially if it's a case like this, where God spoke that Isaac was a promise, he spoke that it was his will for Isaac to be in Abraham's life, you know, God truly did want this thing to come to pass. If you will fully surrender these things back to God, then God will say, no, 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 he'll stop you once he sees that you were going to be obedient with this thing and he'll go, you're ready for it. Now you can keep it and enjoy it the rest of your life. Amen, because I know that you're ready to sustain this thing. And he does it to prove it to ourselves a lot of the time too. You know, faith being tested shows us where we're at spiritually a lot of the time. God knows where our faith is at, you know, but a lot of the times he tests us in our faith and he asks us to walk out this testing of our faith um, because we need to see where we're at. Amen. And a lot of times, how many of you guys know that a lot of times you don't know where your faith is at until a storm hits in your life? Amen. Can we have some truth talk? You know, a lot of us can talk the talk and walk the walk pretty easily in seasons where everything's going our way, where we feel good about things. But then, you know, the moment that a storm hits our life, that's where, you know, you really find out where your trust is. The moment that you are, you know, $500 short in your bank account and you've got a bill that comes out the next day, that's where you find out where your faith is. Is your faith in God? Do you feel, are you resting in that day before? Or are you freaking out and panicking and running around? You know, um, we find out where our faith truly is in the middle of turbulence, in the middle of the storm a lot of the time, in the middle of these hard seasons or of these hard times in our personal lives. Amen. And so basically, I want you guys to imagine this must have felt like complete heartbreak to Abraham. And, you know, I think it's interesting. God purposely didn't explain why he wanted Abraham to surrender Isaac. 
Amen. God will do this to us in our personal lives as well, ladies and gents. He won't always tell you why he needs you to give that thing back to him. He won't always tell you why there's a surrender involved in a particular thing. He's just waiting to see, are you going to be obedient? Amen. Because that's faith too. You know, if God explained everything to you and if we knew everything, that would require zero faith. And faith is what pleases God, ladies and gents. But he's looking to see, are you going to be obedient to me? You know, um, I give you this example a lot of the time, but I talk about, you know, our spiritual life is kind of like, you know, breaking in a horse, breaking a horse. You know, when they're breaking a horse to prepare it to have a rider, um, what they will do is they've got to get the independence out of that horse, right? You know, they've got to get that um, fiery spirit knocked out of that horse so that when the rider says, make a right turn here, make a left turn here, go faster, go slower, stop, all of that, the horse doesn't even think twice. They're immediately obedient to that command. And the reason that they are immediately obedient to that command is because the horse learns that it's for the horse's good, that they learn to get obedient. But sometimes it's a process of getting that, <coughs> excuse me, independent nature out of that horse, you know, so that they will learn to trust, so that they will learn to get obedient more quickly. And, you know, this is what God wants us to work towards in our lives. And the more spiritually mature we become, the faster when God says, hey, go this way, don't go this way, we'll just do it without thinking twice, without pitching a fit, without going to him and, you know, absolutely freaking out. We'll just say, okay, God, because you so trust the good nature of your rider, quote unquote, if you're that horse symbolically, right? You so trust the good nature of who God is over your life that you know that if he's telling you to do something or not do something, it's for your good. You know, I give you guys this example a lot too. Let's say that there's a horse and it's, it's really dark outside, right? And, you know, they're running along this path and all of a sudden the rider sees a cliff up ahead. And unless that horse stops really quickly, they're both going over the cliff and they're going to die. You know, what would happen if that horse was having doubts about the rider's commands? And if they said, well, I'm just going to wait a little bit. I'm not really going to stop when he pulls on the reins. You know, I'm not really going to take quick action when he gives me direction over this particular area of my life. I'm going to see for myself. Who am I talking to? A lot of us are guilty of this in our lives as Christians, right? God will say, don't go this way. Don't go down this path. Or he'll open the door and give us the green light and he'll go, go this way. And we'll hesitate and we'll go, I'm going to see for myself over this. God. And he's like, <laughs> you know, how many of you guys are, are grateful that God is patient with us? Amen. Even when we do silly stuff. Um, but think about that. You know, that horse needs to learn how to be quickly obedient to the rider, to the one who's in charge and who has authority in that moment. Because if the horse does stop quickly, it could save both of their lives from toppling over that cliff. But if the horse thinks about it or decides that they don't want to go in the direction of the rider or whatever's going on, you know, it could potentially cause enormous damage. And this is what happens in our lives when we're not faithful to be obedient to the voice of God quickly in our lives. It's always going to hurt us. You know, God's voice is always to protect us, to love us, to give us his best in any area of our lives, even if it doesn't look like it on the surface to us initially, even if from the limited perspective and the limited details that we have over a thing, you know, even if we don't understand it yet, God's will is always good for you. He's not just doing stuff arbitrarily in your life or trying to steal your fun and all this stuff. That's just not the way God operates. Amen. He's always trying to do things for your good. And this is very important in the context of our story today. Okay. All righty. So I want you guys to watch Abraham's actions because I think this is so powerful. All right. It says, actually, I'm going to grab some more tea. Okay, it says, so Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him. Then on the third day, can you imagine? Okay, I think we overlook this part a lot too. So they're traveling on this journey and Abraham knows the ultimate destination and goal of this and Isaac doesn't. And can you imagine what was probably going through Abraham's mind for three days straight? He's just thinking about the fact that he's about to go murder his son basically and his son's gonna be watching him do it. Can you imagine the pressure? Like, can you imagine what that must have felt like? You know, I think that a lot of times we overlook how awful this must have felt for Abraham, right? Let's keep going. On the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, the lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. 
you know, here's the thing that I think is cool about this. When Abraham said that he was going to go worship, he was a lying. Have you guys ever thought about this? A lot of times we think about worship just being singing, raising our hands, playing an instrument, whatever. But worship is obedience. Amen. In our lives, an act of worship is being obedient to the voice of our father. So when Abraham said they were going to worship, they literally were going to worship. Amen. Because it brings glory to God when we're obedient to what he asks us to do in our personal lives. Amen. It says, we're going to go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. There he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Wow. Okay, I want you guys to imagine what Abraham's heart must have been feeling like in this moment. So they had done this before. You know, Isaac was old enough. We don't know, you know exactly how old. You know, um, they kind of have an idea on his rough age that he was in this passage. But he had been through this whole process of sacrifices, offering up sacrifices. This was a family that was, you know, for the most part, trying to be obedient to the Lord, right? And so the son knew the routine, right? And he's sitting there and he's going, something is not right here. He's going, there's always a sacrifice. We've always got a lamb, something, you know, we always have something that we're going to, you know, sacrifice. And dad, where's the sacrifice? So something's just not sitting right with Isaac. He's beginning to catch on that this trip is different this time. Okay. Verse eight, and, Amber, and Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Now, that phrase is so, so critical. It says, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. In other words, Abraham wasn't even trying to figure it out in his own strength. I absolutely love that. He just said, you know what? God asked for this and you know there will be an offering. I don't know how it's gonna happen. I don't know what this is gonna look like. I'm gonna be obedient to do what he told me to, but that part's up to God. My part is the obedience. God's part is to figure this out and to supply that part, amen? This guy was a boss in his faith, like really, really good. Okay, let's keep going. It says, then they came to the place which God had told him and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order and he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. You guys notice that God did not stop him right up until the very, very last second. Literally, dude is holding the knife above his son and is getting ready to slay him. Can you imagine the heartbreak, the, the horror in Isaac's eyes as he sees his own father trying to go towards his chest or wherever he was headed with this knife? You know, can you see the, the feelings of betrayal that must have been happening inside of his heart? Can you see the heartbrokenness that must have been happening inside of Abraham of, I don't know how this is happening, you know, but I trust God. That guy had a ton of trust in God, amen, to be willing to do this. But then I want you to hear what God did. Listen to this. Verse 11, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here am I. So notice they stopped him just in the nick of time before this was going to happen. And you know, God knew that Isaac would never be killed. He knew this, but he needed to see if Abraham was willing to be obedient because you know what? By Abraham proving his obedience in this moment, by proving that Isaac did not have a hold over him, it was going to allow him to keep Isaac. Amen. It was going to prove to God that, you know, he was ready to not only receive this blessing, but to sustain this blessing in his personal life. How powerful is this? Let's keep going. It says, and he said, do not lay your hand on the lad, nor do anything to him. For I now know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. That's the other thing, ladies and gents. I think we forget about this part. Notice that it says specifically that this son came from God. It came from the Father. Amen. All the blessings in our life come from God. Amen. I want you guys to remember this. So if it never belongs to us in the first place, if God asks for it back, it shouldn't be a problem, right? Like if I loan you something, um, let's say that I loaned you a grill, 
you know, and you want to go cook outside one night and you don't have one. If I were to ask for my grill back, would that be a problem? No, because it was never yours to begin with, right? And so I think that a lot of times we've got to approach these things from that perspective. We forget this. We, we feel like it's just ours. No, you know, every good and gift, perfect gift, the Bible says, comes from the Father in our personal lives. And so if God asks for something back, amen, it, we've got to remember that it came from him in the first place. That includes our finances. That includes, you know, the, um, the resources that he puts in our life, the people, the relationships, all of this different stuff, right? And so it says, you know, in this passage, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me, amen? And basically God says, now that I see that this thing doesn't have a hold over you, Abraham, now that your faith has been tested, now that I see that your heart is still for me first, you get to fully rest, fully enjoy this season of victory in your life, fully enjoy this blessing that I always had for you all along, Abraham. Now you can rest in this thing because you've learned how to do it right this time. Amen. You've learned how to put me first in these areas of your life. And now this stuff doesn't have a hold over you. So now you're going to be able to enjoy it. A lot of times we forget that we can't enjoy it a lot of the time if it has a hold over us. We can't. We think we can't a lot of the time, but we can't. And that's another motive that God has for asking for this stuff back and for asking us to walk through this test is he wants to show us, I don't just want to give this good stuff to you. I want you to be able to enjoy it. Amen. That is God's heart for you, and that's what he wants for you in this season, ladies and gents. Amen? Let's keep going. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horn. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it for a burnt offering instead of his son. You know, God provided the provision for that need. Amen? He caused something else to stand in the gap. You know, and what's cool is God had that ram prepared all along. You know, Abraham didn't know that on purpose. God didn't show him that on purpose. You know, but God had that other form of provision taken care of, you know. And so we've got to understand that God can provide for you in all kinds of different ways in your life. Amen. But our job is simply to trust him and to be willing to be obedient and to not overthink things. I don't know about you guys. I am the worst about that sometimes. Um but not to overthink things and to simply trust in his character and his goodness towards us. And that if he's asking us for something, you know, or if he's asking us to do something, whatever that thing may be, it's always, always, always for our good. Ladies and gents, it's never to withhold something from us. It's never to hurt us or to hurt our heart. It's always for his glory. It's always for our good, you know, and so that he can give us the very best that he has for us in these different areas of our life. He wants you to have these things even more than you want to have these things in your personal life. Amen. But he doesn't want them to have a hold over you. Let's continue. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The other thing that I love about this is so often we try to provide for ourselves in our own strength, and we forget who our ultimate provider is, who our ultimate covering is. And I want to remind you guys of the simple truth today. Your paycheck is not your provider, ladies and gents. A lot of us have that mixed up. Your paycheck is not your provider. It is a form of provision that God can use to bless you with in your personal life, but that's not your source. I want you guys to remember this. That is not where your form of provision comes from. God is your provider, amen? And if we would learn to look to him as that provider in our personal lives and all these different areas of our lives, not just our finances, it would change things, ladies and gents. And what I love about this is Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. That's what happens when your faith kicks in. Ladies and gents, you truly begin to believe that the Lord will provide for you in the areas of your life where you need it. And not just that he's going to give you the bare minimum. That's a lie from the enemy that he likes to bring up a lot of the time. God will do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond all you could ever ask, hope, or imagine in your life. But it requires our full surrender, ladies and gents. If we were to receive the best that God has for us, we've got to be willing to surrender. I like to use this analogy a lot of the time. Let's say that I've got a pen. i got a pen here. And let's say that God is asking for this pen. Well, I've got to be willing to completely let go of the pen on my side if I want him to fully take that thing and be able to steward that thing and do with it what he wants with free movement. But this is what we do a lot of the time in our lives. God will ask us for something and we'll kind of give him a little bit. We'll let him have one side of the pen, but we're still clamped on on the other side. And he's yanking at it and he's going, okay, 
it was a good first step, but I need you to like legit give this thing to me. <laughs> you know, he's like, I need you to legit allow me to have this thing from you. You know, I need you to legit surrender Isaac. Don't just give me a little part of it. Don't just do half the steps. I need you to fully give me this thing so that I can do what I need to do with it. And you know, I think a lot of times we try to hang on to stuff in our lives out of a place of control, worry, fear, all of that stuff. And when those voices, quote unquote, start to come up in your life from the enemy camp, you've got to learn how to shut them down and to decree the word of the Lord over your situation. You know, God always does things that work for my good. God is not out to hurt me. God does not withhold good things from me. He is doing exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all I could ever ask, hope, or imagine in my life, even now, even during this circumstance that I don't understand. You know, he will provide for me. Maybe you haven't seen that provision hit yet, but you need to stand in a place of faithfulness of the Lord is my provider. Amen? proclaiming truth over that particular situation and keeping yourself in alignment and letting go of that place of control and saying, you know what, God, I'm tired of struggling in my own strength in these different areas of my life. I am tired of constantly being in this back and forth battle with you and never truly getting breakthrough in my life because I refuse to release my grip over this thing. I refuse to give up Isaac. I refuse to give up these things that I have been holding so dear to my heart out of a place of fear, worry, anxiety, control. And so God, I'm going to give you the full authority. I'm going to give you full control over these areas, knowing that you know what's best for me even more than I know what's best for me in my personal life. And when we do that, ladies and gents, that's when miracles break forth. When we do that, ladies and gents, that's when you see these bigger level blessings that will start to come into your life. Amen. Because God's faithful and he doesn't take the things that you trust to him lightly. Ladies and gents, he can be trusted with the desires of your heart. He can be trusted with those things that you need in the natural. Amen. You know, God can be trusted in every single area of your life, but he's not going to be in that tug of war match with you. You know, he let you have a free will for a reason. And so if you try to stay clamped down in one area of your life, you know, he'll let you stay clamped down, but you also won't get the same breakthrough that you could have had if you would have fully surrendered it. And, you know, for a lot of us, we have different areas of strength and weakness. You know, some of you guys probably are really good with your finances and surrendering that to God. And for some people, that's still an area where you really struggle with fear and control. You know, some of you guys, you really are good with surrendering your relationships to the Lord. And other ones of you guys, you're like, nope, God, I don't want you to touch that area of my life. You know, you can have all these other areas, but you can't have that area of my life, God. So I want you to do some self-inventory. This can look like a bunch of different things, but are there any areas of your life life today where you have told God, you can't have this area of my life. You can have all these other areas, but you can't have this particular area of my life. God, that's my area. You know, this is where you're kind of failing the Isaac test right now. Amen. And it's okay. You know, God will let you go back, back around the mountain again and to retake this test so that you can pass it again in the future but it delays your promise and sometimes if you aren't careful it will cause you to settle for things that god never told you to settle with and or in in your personal life you know sometimes if you refuse to surrender control to god in different areas of your life you will receive less than the promises that he had for you and you will end up birthing ishmael's with your life when you were always intended to birth isaac's you know, not everybody is equipped to birth Isaacs with their life. Not everybody is equipped to walk in the God promises that he has for their life because it means surrendering our timing to the Lord. Amen. And sometimes that requires waiting a little bit longer. You know, Abraham and Sarah waited way longer than all their friends and family for that child to be birthed. Amen. You know, sometimes it requires, you know, exchanging his ways being higher than our ways. You know, sometimes it requires you know, all kinds of different stuff, you know, when we choose to fully give up control to God in an area of our lives. And some people are just frankly unwilling to do that. But the ones who are willing to, they're going to see the biggest miracles and blessings in their life. And it's so 1,010% going to be worth it, ladies and gents. It's so worth it when you surrender something to the Lord, when you give an area of your life to him and when it's a surrendered life, it will be way better than anything you could have gotten or done in your own strength. I guarantee you. And when you do things God's way, not only does he give you the best gift you could ever imagine, but he gives you the power to steward it and he allows you to keep it when you do things his way. This is why so many people, when they try to do things the world's way, 
they'll end up losing it a few years down the line because they never allowed God to take them through the Isaac test. They never allowed God to prepare them. This is why, you know, a lot of people get married young. I mean, but there's a lot of people who also get divorced just a few years later. Why? The Isaac test. Amen, ladies and gents. You know, a lot of people will step into that manager role, but they'll get fired a year down the line because their character was not ready to sustain the promise. They had not fully surrendered and made God the Lord of their life to call the shots in these different areas. They hadn't given him permission to take over this place of control in their lives. So therefore, when they, as an imperfect person, tried to main control, maintain control more than God, they wonder why it falls apart. Well, it's because you're imperfect. You know, we feel like a lot of the times by keeping our control over these people, these situations, these circumstances, that it's going to be in better hands, you know, by us being in charge. No, it's not. Because we're imperfect. We can have the best of intentions over a situation, ladies and gents. But it is way less safe in our hands than it is in God's hands simply because we are imperfect and we are human. Amen. And so I want you guys to remember that. I'm going to read you the rest of this passage and then um, we'll kind of end it here. It says, The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing, you have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing will I bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men. They rose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt in Beersheba. I want you guys to notice this, and I want you guys to remember this. When you guys make a decision to be obedient to God and to fully surrender these things in your life to him, that blessing doesn't just affect you. It affects those who are supposed to be connected to you. It affects generations down the line. And then a lot of you guys don't realize that your yes to God is going to influence people 100, 200 years from now. That's what a surrendered life can do. That's what saying yes to God's promises can do. That's what passing this Isaac test in your life, the impacts that it can make for years Amen. That's why the battle has been so hard for some of you. Some of you guys have been facing enormous battles over these Isaac promises in your personal life, things that God has promised you, years that you've waited and stewarded these things, years that you've been in the thick of the battle, you know, and God saying it's because there's so much legacy attached to this. You don't see it yet. But there's so much destiny attached to these promises that God is wanting to send into your life, ladies and gents. And it's not just going to affect you. It's going to affect potentially hundreds of people down the line through just what God's doing in little old you. Amen. That's what's so significant about this, ladies and gents. And so I want to encourage you guys today, don't give up. And just because you failed this test in the past, maybe, you know, I've been guilty of this too in my past. It doesn't mean that you can't retake it and that God can't do fantastic things for you and your future. But remember, you know, God wants you to have the blessing. He doesn't want that blessing to have you. He doesn't want anything to have more control over you than he has control over you in your life. Amen. Because if so, it wouldn't be a good gift. And a lot of times we would drop it as soon as we got it. Amen. And that's not God's heart for you. He doesn't want you to have to go through more heartache and more pain the moment that you receive the, something. He wants it to be a good gift for the rest of your life. Amen. So I hope that helps you guys. Hope you have a great day. I'll chat with you again soon.